Hello, our Friday assignment. So it says, read chapter seven of Animal Farm. If you don't have a book, a PDF is available on Google Classroom and answer the questions. In this chapter, we see Napoleon's violent tendencies against the animals he's in charge of. Fair warning, this chapter gets a bit grim, <laughs> to say the least. Um, but the actual, of course, a helicopter flying overhead right as I'm recording. Excellent, love DC. Um, so the actual, question says since snowball was forced out of the farm the propaganda machine of squealer has continued talking about him and rewriting history to suit what napoleon wants how are the animals starting to remember and think about snowball what stereotypes about snowball are they starting to build fill out the table below to answer the questions this question is going to be mostly answered actually through chapter six which was the chapter that we read last week, but there are elements from chapter seven that can be used to fill out this chart. So it says, what did Snowball actually do or say before he was kicked out? So you have to go back a few chapters. What information on Napoleon and Squealer spreading about Snowball? You'll be looking in this chapter and in our last chapter to answer this. I'm gonna switch over to chapter seven. Um, once again, quick reminder, this might have to be in two parts uh, because this app I have to record my screen only does 15 minutes tops and it usually takes longer than that for me to read a chapter. So just keep a lookout for two parts. Chapter 7. It was a bitter winter. The stormy weather was followed by sleet and snow and then by a hard frost which did not break till well into February. The animals carried on as best they could with the rebuilding of the windmill well knowing that the outside world was watching them and that the envious human beings would rejoice with triumph, would rejoice and triumph if the mill was not finished on time. Out of spite, the human beings pretended not to believe that it was Snowball who had, who was, who had destroyed the windmill. I believe it was supposed to be who had destroyed the windmill. They said that it had fallen down because the walls were too thin. The animals knew that this was not the case. Still, it had been decided to build build the walls three feet thick this time instead of 18 inches as before which meant collecting much larger quantities of stone for a long time the quarry was full of snowdrifts and nothing could be done some progress was made in the dry frosty weather that followed but it was cruel work and the animals could not feel so hopeful about it as they felt before they were always cold and usually hungry as well only boxer and clover never lost heart Squealer made excellent speeches on the joy of service and the dignity of labor, but the other animals found more inspiration in Boxer's strength and his never failing cry of, I will work harder. In January, food fell short. The corn ration was drastically reduced and it was announced that an extra potato ration would be issued to make up for it. Then it was discovered that the greater part of the potato crop had been frosted in the clamps, which, was not, which had not been covered thickly enough. The potatoes had become soft and discolored and only a few were edible. For days at a time, the animals had nothing to eat but chaff and mangles. No idea what that is, but it sounds gross. Starvation seemed to stare them in the face. It was vitally necessary to conceal this fact from the outside world. Emboldened by the collapse of the windmill, the human beings were inventing fresh lies about Animal Farm. Once again, it was being put about that all the animals were dying of famine and disease, and that they were continuously fighting amongst themselves and had resorted to cannibalism and infanticide. Napoleon was well aware of the bad results that might follow if the real facts of the food situation were known, and he decided to make sure of Mr. Wiper to spread the contrary impression. Hitherto, the animals had little or no contact with Wiper on his weekly visits. Now, however, a few selected animals, mostly sheep, were instructed to remark casually in his hearing the rations had been increased. In addition, Napoleon ordered that almost empty bins in the store shed to be filled nearly to the brim with sand, which was then covered up with what remained of the grain and meal. On some suitable, on some suitable pretext, Wiper was led to the store shed and allowed to catch a glimpse of the bins. He was deceived and continued to report the outside world that there was no food shortage on Animal Farm. Nevertheless, towards the end of January, it became obvious that it would be necessary to procure some more grain from somewhere. In these days, Napoleon rarely appeared in public, but spent all of his time in the farmhouse, which was guarded at each door by fierce-looking dogs. When he did emerge, it was in ceremonial manner, with an escort of six dogs who closely surrounded him and growled if anyone came too near. 
Frequently, he did not even appear on Sunday mornings, but issued his orders through one of the other pigs, usually Squealer. One Sunday morning, Squealer announced that the hens, who had just come to lay again, must surrender their eggs. Napoleon had accepted, though, through Wiper, a contract for 400 eggs a week. The price of these would pay for enough grain and meal to keep the farm going till summer came on and conditions were easier. When the hens heard this, they raised a terrible outcry. They had been warned earlier that this sacrifice might be necessary, but had not believed it would really happen. They were just getting their clutches ready for the spring sitting, and they had protested that to take the eggs away now was murder. For the first time since the expulsion of Jones, there was something resembling a rebellion. Led by three young black minery pullets, the hens made a determined effort to thwart Napoleon's wishes. Their method was to fly up to the raptors, there and there lay their eggs, which smashed to pieces on the floor. Napoleon acted swiftly and ruthlessly. He ordered the hen's rations to be soft, to be stopped, and decreed that any animal giving so much as a grain of corn to a hen should be punished by death. The dog saw to it that these orders were carried out. For five days the hens held out. Then they capitulated and went back to their nesting boxes. Nine hens had died in the meantime. Their bodies were buried in the orchard, and it was given out that they had died of Ooh, Ca Cossidiosis? Cossidiosis? Weinberg heard nothing of this affair, and the eggs were duly delivered. A grocer's van driving up to the farm once a week to take them away. All this while no more had been seen of Snowball. He was rumored to be hiding on one of the neighboring farms, either Foxwood or Pinchfield. Napoleon was by this time on slightly better terms with the other farmers than before. It happened that there was in the yard a pile of timber which had been stacked there ten years earlier with when a beech spinney was cleared. It was well seasoned, and Wiper had advised Napoleon to sell it. Both Mr. Pilkington and Mr. Frederick were anxious to buy it. Napoleon was hesitating between the two, unable to make up his mind. It was noticed that whenever he seemed at the point of coming to an agreement with Frederick, Snowball was declared to be hiding at Foxwood, while he inclined towards Pilkington, Snowball was said to be at Pinchfield. Suddenly, early in the spring, an alarming thing was discovered. Snowball was secretly... Ooh, I lost my spot. Snowball was secretly frequenting the farm at night. The animals were so disturbed that they could hardly sleep in their stalls. Every night, it was said, he came creeping in under the cover of darkness and performed all kinds of mischief. He stole the corn, he upset the milk pails, he broke the eggs, he trampled the, the seed beds, he gnawed the bark off the fruit trees. Whenever anything went wrong, it became useful to attribute it to Snowball. If a window was broken or a drain was blocked up, someone was certain to say that Snowball had come in the night and done it. And when the key of the store shed was lost, the whole farm was convinced that Snowball had thrown it down the well. Curiously enough, they went on believing this even after the mislaid key was found under a sack of meal. The clouds declared unanimously that Snowball crept into their stalls and milked them in their sleep. The rats, which had been troublesome that winter, were also said to be in league with Snowball. Napoleon decreed that there should be a full investigation into Snowball's activities. With his dogs in attendance, he set out and made a careful tour of inspection of the farm buildings the other animals following at a respectful distance. At every few steps, Napoleon stopped and snuffed the grounds for traces of Snowball's footsteps, which he said he could detect by the smell. He snuffed every corner in the barn, in the cowshed, in the hen houses, in the vegetable garden, and found traces of Snowball almost everywhere. He would put his snout to the ground, give several deep sniffs, and exclaim in a terrible voice, Snowball! He has been here! I can smell him distinctly, and at the word snowball, all the dogs let out a blood-curdling growls and showed their side teeth. The animals were thoroughly frightened. It seemed to them as though snowball was some kind of invisible influence, pervading the air about them and menacing them with all kinds of dangers. In the evening, Squealer called them together, and with an alarmed expression on his face, he told them they had the, he had some serious news to report. "'Comrades!' cried Squealer, making little nervous skips. "'A most terrible thing has been discovered. "'Snowball has sold himself to Frederick of Pinchfield Farm, "'who is even now plotting to attack and take our farm away from us. "'Snowball is to act as his guide when the attack begins. "'But there is worse than that. "'We had thought Snowball's rebellion was caused simply by his vanity and ambition. "'But we were wrong, comrades. "'Do you know what the real reason was?' Snowball was in league with Jones from the very start. 
He was Jones' secret agent at all all the time. It had been proved by documents which he left behind and which we have only just discovered. To my mind, this explains a great deal, comrades. Do we not see for ourselves how we attempted, fortunately without success, to get us defeated and destroyed at the Battle of the Cowshed? <laughs> the animals were stupefied. This was a wickedness for outdoing Snowball's destruction of the windmill. But it was some minutes before they could fully take it in. They all remembered or thought they remembered how they had seen Snowball charging ahead of them at the Battle of the Cowshed, how he had rallied and encouraged them at every turn, and how he had not paused for an instant even when the pellets from Jones's gun had wounded his back. At first, it was a little difficult to see how this fitted in with being on Jones's side. Even Boxer, who seldom asked questions, was puzzled. He lay down, tucked his forehooves beneath him, shut his eyes, and with a hard effort managed to formulate his thoughts. I do not believe that, he said. Snowball fought bravely at the Battle of the Cowshed. I saw him myself. Did we not give him animal hero first class immediately afterwards? That was our mistake, comrade, for we know now, it is all written down on the secret documents that we have found, that in reality he was trying to lure us to our doom. But he was wounded, said Boxer. We all saw him running with blood. That was part of the arrangement, cried Squealer. Jones' shotgun only grazed him. I could show you this in our own writing, if you were able to read it. The plot was for Snowball, at the critical moment, to give the signal for flight and leave the field to the enemy. And he would, and he nearly succeeded. I will even say, comrades, he would have succeeded if it had not been for our heroic leader, Comrade Napoleon. Do you not remember how, just at the moment when Jones and his men had gone inside the yard, Snowball suddenly turned and fled, and many animals followed him? And do you not remember, too, that it was just at that moment, when panic was spreading and all seemed lost, that Comrade Napoleon sprang forward with a cry of death to humanity, and sank his teeth in Jones's leg? Surely you remember that, comrades, exclaimed Squealer, frisking from side to side. Now, when Squealer described the scene so graphically, it seemed to the animals that they did remember it. At any rate, they remembered that at the critical moment of the battle, Snowball had turned to flee. But Boxer was still a little uneasy. I do not believe that Snowball was a traitor at the beginning, he said finally. What he has done since is different, but I believe that at the Battle of the Cowshed, he was a good comrade. Our leader, Comrade Napoleon, announced Squealer, speaking very slowly and firmly, has stated, categorically, categorically, comrade, that Snowball was Jones's ancient from the very beginning, yes, and from long before the rebellion was ever thought of. Ah, that is different, said Boxer. If Comrade Napoleon says it, it must be true. That is the true spirit, comrade, cried Squealer, but it was noticed he cast a very ugly look at Boxer with his little twinkly eyes. He turned to go, then paused, and added impressively, I warn any animal on this farm to keep his eyes very wide open, for we have reason to think that some of Snowball's agents are looking among us at this moment. Four days later, in the late afternoon, Napoleon ordered all the animals to assemble in the yard. When they were all gathered together, Napoleon emerged from the farmhouse, wearing both his medals, for he had recently awarded himself Animal Hero First Class and Animal Hero Second Class, with his nine huge dogs frisking around and uttering growls that sent shivers down all the animal spines. They all cowered silently in their places, seeming to know in advance that some terrible thing was about to happen. Napoleon stood sternly, surveying his audience. Then he uttered a high-pitched whimper. Immediately, the dogs bounded forward, seized four of the pigs by the ear, and dragged them, squealing with pain and terror, to Napoleon's feet. The pigs' ears were bleeding, and the dogs had tasted blood, and for a few moments they appeared to be quite mad. To the amazement of everybody, three of them flung themselves upon Boxer. Boxer saw them coming and put out his great hoof, caught a dog in midair, and pinned him to the ground. The dog shrieked for mercy, and the other two fled with their tails between their legs. Boxer looked at Napoleon to know whether he should crush the dog to death or let it go. Napoleon appeared to change countenance and sharply ordered Boxer to let the dog go, whereat Boxer lifted his hoof and the dog shrunk the dog slunk away, bruised and howling. All right, I'm going to stop now before we run out of time. Okay, I'll be back for part two, starting with presently.